Hey guys and welcome to Hari Gastro. In today's video, we'll be talking about familial hypercholesterolemia. So let's get started. So what is familial hypercholesterolemia? Familial hypercholesterolemia is a genetic disorder which is usually caused by a defect on chromosome number 19. This defect makes the body unable to remove low-density lipoproteins, which are also called LDLs, or the bad cholesterol from the blood, which therefore causes the LDL levels to greatly increase in the blood. This in turn causes the narrowing of the arteries from atherosclerosis at an early age. Familial hypercholesterolemia is typically passed down through families in an autosomal dominant manner. This means that the patient only needs to inherit one abnormal gene from one parent in order to inherit the disease. So from this definition of familial hypercholesterolemia, we get that it is an increase in the body's LDL levels or low density lipoprotein levels. So if we take a look at this picture on my right, we see we have HDL and LDL, which are actually the two types of lipoproteins that carry cholesterol throughout our bodies. So the HDL says, I'm the good or happy cholesterol, and my job is to keep your arteries clear and free from plaques. And then we look at LDL, and he says, I'm the bad or lethal cholesterol, and I form plaques in your arteries, causing them to harden and narrow. So if we take a closer look at this picture at the bottom, we see that in a normal artery, when we have the presence of HDL in good amounts, we don't have any narrowing or fat infiltration into that body of the arterial wall. On the other hand, if we have high amounts of LDL cholesterol, we see the forming of these atherosclerotic plaques that develop within the vessel wall and therefore cause the narrowing of the blood flow. So let's expand a little further on these two lipoproteins called HDL and LDL. So as we mentioned in the first slide, there are two kinds of lipoproteins that carry cholesterol throughout our bodies. They are the LDLs or the low density lipoproteins and the HDLs, which are the high density lipoproteins. So the low density lipoproteins are sometimes called the bad cholesterol because it leads to the buildup of fat in our arteries. The higher the LDL number, the greater the risk of cholesterol depositing in your arteries. And this can lead to a heart attack or a stroke. The high density lipoproteins or the HDLs, however, are known as the good cholesterol and they carry cholesterol from other parts of the body back to the liver and once this cholesterol is delivered to the liver, it is excreted into the bile and hence the intestine either directly or indirectly after conversion into bile acids can remove it. So there's also delivery of HDL cholesterol to the adrenal glands, the ovary and the testes and this is important for the synthesis of steroid hormones. So having a high HDL level may be a biomarker for protection against heart disease. So the HDLs, when they are found in larger amounts, are very helpful to the body. But when we have a patient who suffers from familial hypercholesterolemia, we have an increase in the LDLs or the bad cholesterol. And in these patients, the main manifestation of this disease is the deposition of these LDL cholesterol plaques into the walls of the arterial vessels. So moving on, let's talk about how is familial hypercholesterolemia inherited? So like many other genetic conditions, familial hypercholesterolemia is an inherited disease. The disease has an autosomal dominant form of transmission. And that means that each child of a parent who has the disease has a 50% chance of inheriting the disorder. It is therefore essential to screen parents, siblings and children of a person diagnosed with familial hypercholesterolemia to find others who may have inherited the bad genes. So at present, most people with familial hypercholesterolemia have gene mutations which occur on chromosome number 19. And these mutations usually occur in one of three genes, the LDLR gene, the ARPOB gene, or the PCSK9 gene. So if we take a look at this picture on my left, we see that the disease has an autosomal dominant form of transmission. That means if we have an affected dad and an unaffected mom, the chances of each child being affected is 50%. So of the boys, we will have one boy that's affected and one unaffected boy. And of the girls, we can have an affected girl or an unaffected girl. So we therefore have a 50% chance of transmission. 
And if we take a closer look at chromosome number 19, we see that the gene mutations which occur on this chromosome are actually responsible for the development of a familial hypercholesterolemia. And to mention those specific gene mutations again, they are the LDLR gene mutation, the ApoB gene mutation, and the PCSK9 gene mutation. And these all occur on chromosome number 19. So now let's talk about some symptoms and signs. Patients with familial hypercholesterolemia will show various signs and symptoms of ischemic heart disease, peripheral vascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, and even aortic stenosis. And this will all be due to the blockage of those various vessels in the body. These patients may also suffer from articular symptoms such as tendinitis or arthralgias, which can be present. So if we take a closer look at picture A, we see the lateral borders of a thickened Achilles tendons, and this is seen here bilaterally. The patient may also have unusual skin lesions, such as cutaneous xanthomas, and these are skin lesions caused by cholesterol-rich lipoprotein deposits at birth or by early childhood. So if we look at picture B here, we see the tendinous xanthomas on the extensor tendons of the hands. These are cholesterol-rich deposits. And then if we take a closer look at picture C, we see a xanthelasma, which are cholesterol deposits which occur in the eyelids of the patient. The corneal arcus may also be present and is sometimes circumferential. And this is shown here in picture D. The corneal arcus or arcus cornelis is the result of cholesterol infiltration around the corneal rim. So the cholesterol deposits actually form a sort of circular ring around the cornea itself, and this is called the corneal arcus. And of course, we said that the heart murmur of aortic stenosis may be present. So I want to explore that a little further. So aortic stenosis is the narrowing of the aortic valve opening, and aortic stenosis restricts the blood flow from the left ventricle, which is the most important chamber of the heart because it supplies that oxygen-rich blood to the rest of the body cells, and when we have an aortic stenosis, we have a restriction of blood flow from the left ventricle into the aorta, and this may also affect the pressure of the left atrium. So if we take a closer look at this picture on my left, we see a normal aortic valve, and this is a tricuspid valve. It's got three little leaflets, and then we see what it looks like in a stenotic patient or patient which has a damaged valve. So if the blood is restricted to move out of the left ventricle, we're going to have a decreased amount in oxygen-rich blood that is actually traveling to the rest of the body cells. And this is going to cause a series of catastrophic events for the patient. So I just want to play a little snippet of what the normal heart sound sounds like. So let's give it a listen now. And then this is a patient who suffers from an aortic stenosis. So again, that normal heart sound. And then a patient with aortic stenosis. So now let's talk about the diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia. Diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia is based on the physical examination as well as laboratory testing. The physical examination may find xanthomas, xanthelasmas, and cholesterol deposits in the eye, which is called the corneal arcus. Laboratory testing will include blood testing of cholesterol levels, studies of the heart function, and genetic testing. So the blood testing of the cholesterol levels may show increased total cholesterol levels, which are usually above 300 mg per deciliter, and total cholesterol of more than 250 mg per deciliter in children. The LDL levels are usually found to be above 200 mg per deciliter. So if we look at this little table on my left, we see it's called the lipid profile table, and then we see the normal values, the borderline high and then high-risk patients. 
So usually we would love for the cholesterol levels to be less than 200 milligrams per deciliter. If they are found between 200 and 239 milligrams per deciliter, we have a borderline lipid disease. And then anything greater than 240 milligrams per deciliter is a high risk for lipid disease. And then if we come down to these LDL cholesterol levels, we see that 60 to 130 milligrams per deciliter is a desirable amount. And then 130 to 159 milligrams per deciliter is a borderline risk for atherosclerosis. And then anything from 160 to 189 milligrams per deciliter is actually high risk for heart disease. We can also do studies of heart function, such as a stress test, and these may be abnormal in these patients. And then, of course, we can also do genetic testing, and this may show the alterations or the mutations in those LDL receptor genes. So remember, we mentioned those three gene mutations which can occur. And just to mention them again, those were the LDLR receptor gene mutation, ApoB receptor gene mutation, and the PCSK9 gene mutation. So how can one go about treating a familial hypercholesterolemia? So the first thing we can instruct the patient to do is make some lifestyle changes, such as exercising more and eating a healthy, low-fat diet. And this is the first line of defense against high cholesterol. So specific recommendations may include reducing the amount of saturated fat in the diet to less than 30% of the total daily caloric intake, consuming 10 to 20 grams of soluble fiber, and good sources of fiber may include oats, peas, beans, apple, citrus fruits, and carrots per day. We also instruct the patient to increase their physical activity and to maintain a healthy body weight. And now continuing with treatment methods, we go on to the medical treatment, which can be administered to the patient. So the first line of drugs are called the statins. And these drugs are among the most commonly prescribed medications for lowering cholesterol and act by blocking a substance the liver needs to make cholesterol. This causes the liver to remove cholesterol from the blood. And statins may also help the body reabsorb cholesterol from built up deposits in the arterial wall and therefore potentially reversing coronary artery disease. So some examples of statins include atorvastatine, fluvastatine, lovastatine, pitavastatine, pravastatine, rosuvastatine, and simvastatine. Our second line of drug treatment can be the bile acid binding resins. So our liver requires cholesterol to make bile acids, and this is a substance which is essential for digestion. So the bile acid binding resins, which include cholestyramine, colcevalam, and colstopol, lower the cholesterol indirectly by binding to bile acids. And this promotes the liver to use excess cholesterol to make more bile acids, which reduce the level of cholesterol in the blood. We can also use cholesterol absorption inhibitors. So the small intestine absorbs cholesterol from the diet of the patient and releases it into their bloodstream. And an example of this class of drug is ezatimib, and this helps reduce blood cholesterol by limiting the absorption of dietary cholesterol. Ezatimib can be used in combination with any of these statin drugs. So they can be used together in patients with extremely high levels of cholesterol to bring that cholesterol down much faster. There are also some injectable medications, and this is a new class of drugs which help the liver absorb more LDL cholesterol which lowers the amount of cholesterol circulating in the blood. So examples of these drugs include alirocumab and evolocumab. And these drugs are most useful in patients who have a genetic condition that causes very high levels of LDL. These drugs may also be used in patients who have had heart attacks or strokes and need additional lowering of their LDL levels. The injectable drugs are usually administered at home one to two times per month. And that brings us to the end of this video on familial hypercholesterolemia. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you found the presentation very interesting and informative. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share. And make sure to turn on the bell notification so you'll be notified every time we have a new upload. If you would like to download a copy of the presentation, you may do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and bye for now.